Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to continue our study in this New Testament survey. And today we're going to continue um, along as we're, we'll be finishing up Paul's letters. And so this will be a little bit of a review. We'll go over some of the material in our study guide. And so we'll be talking about first and second Thessalonians and the pastoral epistles in a review fashion. And then we'll talk about Hebrews and James and go through some of the initial stuff that gives us some perspective on that. So let me go ahead and open us up in prayer and we'll go and get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just invite you here in our midst. We're so thankful for your love and grace and how you provided for us. Pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit as we seek to understand your word better. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So as we get into um, this review, and um, I've said this um, many times, but the, the study guide actually has a lot of really good material, and I would really recommend that you take the time and um, use that as an advantage um, for you as you're going through this material. And so we're looking now, um, finishing up with Paul's letters, and um, interesting if you maybe hadn't noticed this, but for the most part, Paul's letters are all grouped together here. Um, and the reason why I say that is there we'll be doing a little bit of an overview tonight that some of the early church fathers thought that Hebrews was written by Paul. Currently, that's not the um, predominant view, but that's just um, one thing to, to keep in, in mind. So from the, the study notes, um, we're going to talk about those five and we get a we from this we are glimpsing into the heart of Paul as he continues to write the to various Christians and so we'll see him engaging with um, a couple of churches and um, some specific individuals and so the first one that we'll be getting into is first and second Thessalonians and so um, as a reminder we showed this last time but here is a map giving you an idea of where Thessalonica is. And so we have Corinth down here. We have Ephesians over here. You can't quite see it on this, in this way. It's where it's blown up. So this is a, a port city in Macedonia. And Paul wrote First Corinth, um, First Thessalonians from Corinth, where he had a fair amount of time there. And so let's get a little bit of perspective on what's going on in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Um, before the Jews could chase Paul away, he had enough time to share the gospel, see people come to faith in Jesus, and establish a church. So he was physically threatened and forced to flee. His heart remained close to the believers in the city. And so you can see how Paul was very active in, in the, the ministry work that he was doing and was, was able to um, see success as a result of that. Um, the overall message of the Thessalonican letters was that the Thessalonians should patiently wait for the return of Jesus and live worthy of God. And so um, the, we'll get into that briefly in, in, a, in a second, but they started to think, well, Christ is coming right away. So why do we need to continue to work and, and do these things? Because then we know that Christ's return is imminent. So the, the recipients, I think, are clearly the, the church in Thessalonica. It was a large and bustling city. It was a prominent place that was ethnically and religiously diverse. We know that it was a city that contained both Jew, Jewish and Gentile populations. Um, what was missed is the powerful presence of the occult in Thessalonica. And so there was a lot of spiritual influences that were, were going on, and you're getting this melting pot of people coming to this Christian church. And it seemed there is warrant to support that within the congregation at Thessalonica, a diverse set of religious background character, characterized the, the membership. These facts may have also uh, may, may also give us insight into understanding what Paul meant when he wrote your you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And so breaking away from idols and focusing on the true God. So 
we'll be having a little bit interspersed between first and thes, thec, um, second Thessalonians. And so the, and for, for the structure for th first Thessalonians, the first letter breaks down into a basic section, um, basic sections after a long section of praise, Paul addresses ethical issues and questions about the end times before closing the book. And so that's uh, the first encounter that, that Paul has. Um, Thessalonians, um, so but the, he would, Paul, Paul was forced to leave due to the opposition that he received. And later Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to check on the church. And Timothy re reports back to Paul to write this letter. And you can see that um, Paul is in Corinth and he sends Timothy back to, to check out the church. And then he comes back and reports that. So we, we see that. Second Thessalonians is a shorter letter um, than the, the first correspondence and with the Thessalonians. Uh, however, just as the return of Christ was the focal point of first Thessalonians, it is a center stage in second Thess um, Thessalonians as well. So um, we get a chance to see um, very quickly there a little bit of a discussion of what's going on in, in the church. Um, these letters were mainly concerned with calling the believer to patiently wait for the return of Christ while resisting false teachers. So it's a melting pot in this church. They're waiting for the coming of, of Christ. They need to be active doing the, the things of the Lord as well as um, being um, working and engaging in, in life um, and all of that. So that's um, a, a quick little synopsis on some of the issues there. But let's now talk about the, the themes. And so first, um, the themes in First Thessalonians, then we'll talk about the, the return of Jesus Christ. The major distinguishing feature of both epistles, First and Second Thessalonians, is the extent of the teaching about the parousia. And that's a fancy word for the returning of, of of Jesus. It's a reference to the second coming of Jesus. Marshall be, believed that the return of Christ um, who would usher in the, the, the day of the Lord was the major point that Paul was driving home. And, and Marshall is one of the references that we have in our study guide in terms of one of the um, theologians. It is really apparent from the letter that the Thessalonians had suffered for their faith. Paul mentions that they suffered the same things that the Jewish Christians had suffered in Judea. What better way to encourage some in the midst of their suffering than to point out, the, point them towards the hope that they have in Jesus. So that's definitely what, what Paul is trying to, to do. And in Second Thessalonians, a big theme is the return of Jesus is near, but not yet. So it's not yet, and so therefore we have to continue to life as, as it is that we, we need to providing for our families and, and, and all of that. So some of the Thessalonians had misunderstood the timing of Christ's return. They thought it was already had happened. Paul writes to assure that the Lord's coming is, is sure, but it hadn't happened yet. Therefore, they should continue to per persevere and not become idle. And so in the, the Greek culture, there was this big separation between the spiritual and the physical. And so some of them could have been a little bit influenced by Gnostic ideology of having this distinction. And so there's going to be a physical return, bodily return of Jesus at the second coming. And so the surety of the Lord's return, as we have stated above, the Thessalonians are experiencing persecution likely at the hand of their fellow countrymen. Um, and the tendency in the midst of persecution is to lash out and, de and defend oneself when people wrong us and we want to strike back, avenging ourselves and, and being um, and bring justice to the to the offender. So that those are the kind of things that are, are going on. But the day of the Lord has not come. This is evident because justice had not come upon the the unbelieving world, but the day was coming. Justice would be without mercy. Um, the Thessalonians should continue to stand firm, trusting that the second coming of Jesus would bring vindication and relief. 
So the, the Lord's return is a future reality. And so we, we look forward to that. Anchoring their future hope in the return of Jesus provides Paul the opportunity to elaborate on the doctrinal aspects of the perusia. And so in chapter two, um, Paul takes the time to outline in more detail what could be um, expected prior to Jesus' return. And so, um, and in terms of idleness, so the Lord's return and the problem of idleness, believers believing that Christ had already returned, idleness seemed to have become a problem for the Thessalonians. And so that was one of the things that, that Paul was having to, to speak into as he was working with his church. So in the first letter of, um, to the Thessalonians that, that the believers were suffering, that was one of the issues that he dealt with. In order to help them persevere, Paul reminded them that the, the return of Christ was sure. Um, it seems that some had misinterpreted his explanation of the perusia. And so in 2 Thessalonians, um, Paul reaffirms the reality of the returning of Christ and made it clear that they, he had not returned yet. And so we can see um, some interesting things that um, Paul is actively engaging in the life of, of the church of Thessalonica. He has a messenger that goes and, and returns and getting that information is, is quite vital to making sure that these letters are accurate and timely and giving the, the most um, relevant information for the, the issues that are going on in that church. So that's a real quick summary of first and second Thessalonians. And now let's go to the um, pastoral epistles, as they're called, where we'll get a chance to talk about Timothy, first and second Timothy, and then we'll also talk about Titus. So for um, so let's first get into to this. And so um, maybe that term, the pastoral epistles, isn't familiar to you, but it's this is where Paul is talking to an individual, a church leader, giving them the information that they need to be successful in a church leadership role. And so they're called this because they are written to two men, Timothy and Titus, who are functioning in pastoral ca capabilities. And second, the letters deal with matters that are off overtly pastoral, um, explaining the, the, the way that the um, things should be organized in the church. Um, however, the relevancy of these letters is not restricted to men in the ministry. The letters themselves give the Christian great insight into the number of theological and practical issues. The, the, the reader will find issues relevant to the Old Testament law and its relevant relevance for today. The role of women and men within the church, what we do for, for widows and the qualifications for, for Christians who, who um, should look to for, for those who are appointed to leadership in churches. And so very important material that, that's covered here. And it's nice in the complement of what we have in scripture that, that we have these. And so um, Paul wrote these pastoral epistles. Um, and I don't think there's any doubt in that. And so um, that's um, just giving a, a little bit of a reminder of that. And so um, we'll be talking a little bit about Timothy um, in a few minutes, but here let's just mention something quickly about Titus. Um, so first, what I have in this graphic here, this is a picture of First Timothy. Um, so we believe that Paul wrote First Timothy in Ephesus, and so that's why this is highlighted. Maybe it was on a, a fourth missionary journey that's not recorded in the book of Acts. And so that gives us a little bit of insight there. Um, zooming out here, we still can see Ephesus in Asia Minor. And um, this was a, a um, book that Paul wrote when he was in prison in, in Rome. And it was is a farewell letter. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But since we're talking at the moment with Titus, I'll go back I'll go to this slide and I'll go back and forth as we're going through this material. So we do not have as much information about Titus as we do Timothy, but we do have some. Titus is mentioned for in um, 2 Corinthians 7 and 6, uh, um, evidently as Paul and his companions were suffering in Macedonia, Titus came and provided the needs and comfort. And so he um, was from um, 
um, Crete. He goes back and ministers there. He's um, giving information and providing resources to, to Paul. And so he provided to, for those, those needs to comfort for him. Titus had visited the, the Corinthian church, had been encouraging during the visit and the encouragement spilled over into the life of Paul. We do, do know that Titus was a, a Greek and had accompanied Paul, Paul when he made the trip to Jerusalem, as mentioned in Galatians 2, 1. And at some point, Paul had left Titus in Crete to put what re remained, in, re re remained in order. So he was very imp important in terms of um, creating and stabilizing the, the church in Crete, where he was from. Um, so let's talk about the, the themes now, and we'll go back up to 1 Timothy. The, the theme is the, the problem of false teaching and the need for, for church order. So false teaching is one of those things that is very um, important. You have a, a society that is not Christian, that Christianity is very new on the scene. And so trying to help people understand that in, in the context of, of not having the um, a lot of background. So false teaching is always a danger that threatens the church. Many of Paul's letters deal with some type of false teaching, as in, for example, Galatians and, and the false gospel, and all of them deal with, with the false ways of, of thinking. The problem of false teaching in Ephesus stands behind the, the letter to Timothy. And so um, Timothy is going to be key in the, the church of Ephesus. And this is a, a church that Paul spent a fair amount of time. And now he's having Timothy taking over that role. Paul knew that the young minister would need advice and encouragement, especially as opponents to orthodoxy arose. Paul writes to challenge a false teaching while calling for right order in the church. If Timothy and the Ephesian Christians were to stand firm in the midst of doctrinal error, the right ordering of the church would be one of the ways they would do so. And so here he's giving that specific instruction. He spent time with Timothy. So this is like a review. Maybe you could sort of think about it like an upper room discourse, thinking in terms of what Jesus did with the apostles as is laid out in, in the Gospel of John. So um, here's something more in, in terms of grace be with you. He's trying to make a deposit into Timothy. And Paul urges Timothy to guard the good deposit. He should fight for what he has been entrusted to him, um, which was nothing less than the gospel and all of the implications for life that comes along with it. Um, there, and then he, he gets into the need for church order with, with the presence of false teaching threatening that the Ephesian church, church order would be of importance when it came to standing firm that the church was disorganized, led by unqualified people and served by those who, who were not fit to serve then keeping the church heading in the right direction would prove difficult. Paul knows Timothy um, will need to order the church rightly for, for him to be successful in refuting false teaching and leading the church in a healthy direction. And so um, Paul, through the, the working of the Holy Spirit with his training and um, things that he had internalized, was aware of here are the kind of things that are necessary to have a successful church environment. The problem of false teaching was not going away anytime soon. If Timothy was going to be faith, faithfully lead the church in Ephesus, he must begin by putting the house in order. That is, the church should be ordered rightly in terms of leadership. Furthermore, Timothy must teach what accords with the sound word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Going back to the very cornerstone, we go back to the teaching and that we know that was given to us from, from Jesus. So Timothy and Titus, were, um, as well as Paul, uh, um, Paul's first letter to Timothy, these two young men are introduced to us in these, in, in other places in scripture. Um, we know that Timothy had been trained in the faith by his mother and grandmother and would have, and would begin traveling with Paul during his second missionary journey. So he was born in a Christian family, teamed up with Paul, was part of his missionary tra travels, and then was key in the, the development of and leadership of the, the Ephesus church. 
we are introduced to Titus in 2 Corinthians as he brings encouragement to Paul. So he's sending messengers back and forth to various churches, and we have a nice example of seeing that with Timothy and Titus. Paul writes his first letter to Timothy in order to encourage Timothy to stand firm in, in the face of false, false teaching. If Timothy was going to lead the church faithfully, then he must appoint elders and teach what accords with sound doctrine. And so that's a quick um, overview of what's going on with, with these, these books, a little bit more focusing on um, 1 Timothy, and then we had spent some time in Titus, but we'll go a little bit more as we finish up talking about 2 Timothy and Titus. And so um, in 2 Timothy, um, this was likely written during Paul's final imprisonment. Given that Paul believed the end of his life was near, it's not surprising to hear Paul talking about coming to his end, being poured out like a drink offering, speaking of the time of his departure, having fought the good fight and finishing the race. At the end of his life, um, Paul desires to pass the torch of his ministry to, to, the, to Ephesus on to Timothy in a final charge to bold witness for the gospel. And that's exactly what we're seeing in um, 2 Timothy. And with that context, maybe it'll make it a little bit more rich for you as you get a chance to, to read it. Um, in terms of a theme in 2 Timothy, an important theme is the unashamed faithfulness to the gospel and ministry. As Paul passes the baton to Timothy, he wants Timothy to be unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Timothy would likely be ridiculed and harassed for the doctrines he believed and taught. Despite the ridicule and harassment, Paul's desire that Timothy remain faithful to do so would mean treasuring the gospel and boldly proclaiming the message. The, the apostle longs for young Timothy to persevere in unashamed gospel ministry till the end as Paul himself had done. And so he's breathing all of this um, experience and helping him be filled with the Holy Spirit and equipped for ministry. And so throughout 2 Timothy, Paul is calling his protege to, to faithfully teach and guard the good news. In a place like Ephesus, where with a false teaching that was always threatening, that the need to teach and guard the truth was desperately needed. And so, nice little reminder of what's going on. Timothy was to devote himself to gospel ministry, and contrary to those who were tempted to be ashamed of the gospel when suffering came, Timothy was to remain bold instead of walking away when times became hard. Timothy should re remember the faithfulness of Paul and look forward to the coming of the, of the Lord. Furthermore, Timothy should be encouraged because God would guard the message and persevere him as he faithfully endured in, in his calling. So um, that's just another synopsis to have us think in terms of 2 Timothy. And now let's um, quickly just do a review of Titus for a few other things. Um, Titus represents the last of the pastoral epistles. Paul had left Titus in Crete to put what remains in order. Paul, as with the letter of Timothy, desired to leave instruction to the young Timothy in order to, to set him up for success as he labored in Crete. Um, the letter gives instruction regarding church leadership, the relationship between older and young, younger believers, to take some, some time to deal with false teaching, um, by opening with a reference to church leadership and by relating how older and younger believers are to relate, Paul seems to imply that a right organization of the church should lead believers to live in accordance with sound doctrine for, for God's glory. So structure can actually help out is, is one of the things that he's trying to make sure that, that Titus um, um, is aware of. Another theme is teaching and sound doctrine. So Paul proceeds from the introduction to present Titus with two basic challenges. First, get good teaching teachers in place. Second, teach the truth. The, the, this book is mainly about teaching. And so we, we see that in um, Titus. Paul is concerned with Titus um, be himself as well as appointing others who would teach what 
what accords with sound doctrine. So he was to be a teacher and he was to teach teachers who then would teach. Teaching sound doctrine includes the concept of um, in chapter two there. And three suggests that it at least includes instructing older men, younger women and younger men um, certain truths. It also includes giving instructions to slaves through special instruction to, mas to masters is missing. Teach certainly um, includes instructing believers in the, the grace of God has appeared, training them to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the, in the present age. And finally, Titus must teach the believers to relate regularly to the authorities. So a lot of material there um, that we really have a great study guide to be um, leveraging. But um, with that, we'll finish up and um, move on to the material that we're going to cover tonight in um, an overview fashion. And then we'll do a review um, next week after you've had a chance to go through the workbook in as much detail as you would like. And so first we'll go through the, the letter um, Hebrews and then we'll talk about James. So here is the ESV study Bible notes uh, outline for, for Hebrews. And so um, it starts out with Jesus is superior to the angelic beings. And so we, we get this um, introductory se section, um, a little bit of um, following the, the, form, the general format of a Greco-Roman letter. Um, there's warnings against neglecting salvation and the remembering who is the founder of salvation, Jesus Christ. And so we, we talk about that. So Jesus is superior to the angels. He's also superior to the, to the Mosaic law. And so if um, this is written towards a, a Jewish Christian audience, that would be one of the things that they would be important for them to understand. So Jesus is greater than Moses. Um, um, there is also a, a warning, a rest for the, the people of, of God that we need to be entering into to God's rest. Um, and then the high priesthood of Jesus, a very long section that's talking about this, um, that Jesus is a great high priest, um, warning against apostasy, the certainty of God's promise. Um, and, and then, so there's a couple things that are um, brought in for um, some greater context. And then getting back to the main argument, um, the priestly order of Melchizedek um, and comparing Jesus to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, as you may recall, is an individual that um, shows up in, um, in Genesis. And we, we get a chance to, to think about that in comparison with, with Jesus. And Jesus, the high priest, is a, is a, of a better covenant. And um, the, the covenant that the Lord had with the nation of Israel, this would be helpful for, for Jewish Christians to begin to, to start to figure that all out. There's redemption through the blood of Christ. And so we have this perfect sacrifice rather than the, the sacrifice that was done in the temple. Um, and then find, then we get on to a call to faith and endurance, that we have the full assurance of our faith um, um, exhortation to draw near, and um, we, we get all that wonderful um, information, and there's the, the Hall of Fame of the faithful believers that we get a chance to, to see in Hebrews 11, and then we are have this um, edict that we should be seek to have this endurance until the, the kingdom fully comes. Um, the, Jesus is the founder and the perfecter of our faith that we're not to grow weary or to be shaken. And finally, he finishes with exhortations on um, um, making ourselves a pleasing a sacrifice to, to God, having a final benediction and final greetings. And so that's just a quick review from a um, outline um, in case as you're reading through it, if you need to have a structure and so um, one of the questions that comes up is who is the author of um, Hebrews? 
and um, in the earliest set of manuscripts, um, it was included with um, the writings of Paul. And so this seemed to reflect the attitude of the Eastern churches for, for sure. Um, the Greek is more polished than other of Paul's letters. Um, Clement of Alexandria suggests that Paul wrote this. Origen thought it was a dis disciple of Paul. And so in these next few charts, I'm not going to go through in much detail. We get a couple um, points of view of what the early church and was thinking who possibly could have been the, 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 the writer. Um, some people would agree that it was, and other people would argue that it wasn't. Um, Calvin argued that it um, maybe was Clement of Rome or maybe Luke. Luther proposed Apollos. Um, the Council of Trent reaffirmed Hebrews as being written by Paul. And today, virtually no one would espouse that it's um, written by, by Paul. And so um, others, and we mentioned a few of these already, but uh, there is a, a variety of individuals. Maybe it was a um, second generation individual like Silas or, or Timothy. I thought that was an intriguing um, possibility. But in, in summary, it's probably best to admit our ignorance on the matter. We don't know who wrote it but it is inspired, um, we include this. Um, and then we'll thinking about, well, who, where was it written? This is, there's uncertainty about this as well. There is this one phrase in um, chapter 13, those from Italy send you greeting, but it's not clear if this meant there were um, believers in Italy or believers simply who were from Italy. So maybe there was some association with Italy as what that might be giving as a possibility. Um, and then trying to figure out, well, when was it written? Um, the addressees and the, and the author appears to belong to the second generation of Christians. And so um, maybe a, a later date might um, be applicable. Um, First Clement um, actually cites Hebrew, so it has to be before um, AD 96. And so um, it, it must have been written in Timothy's lifetime. And so that gives us a, um, another indication and appears that the temple sacrifices are still going on. And so these are some of the interesting facts that we can be using to start to figure out um, events, um, timing of events, locations of events, as we're, we're starting to see here. So the, the Greek is polished. There's um, a lack of reference to Hebrews and Aramaic, which might suggest that the readers did not know Hebrew and Aramaic. And so gradually there was a shift um, to be using Greek only. And then after that, there was a shift to be using Latin as a primary language. But um, this is uh, maybe some, another set of facts that are helpful for us to, to de determine um, where it was written. Then finally, the destination. Um, well, um, earliest attestations of Hebrew um, suggest that it was meant for Rome, and that's um, Clement gives us that information, but really that is um, a, a guess. But um, definitely it's um, written to Jewish Christians seems to be the um, main emphasis. And so that is um, not only who it's written to, but it's, it's definitely clearly the purpose. Um, the, the author's knowledge of Jewish ritual is largely a literary knowledge. And so that's another bit of information for us to be thinking about it. So it's, I think it's reasonable to assume it's, it's addressed towards Jewish Christians. Um, and these would be Hellenistic Jews um, Jews that would be familiar with the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, and they would be accepting that with authority. Um, people are getting more familiar with using Greek as their primary language. Um, and another interesting thing that the Jewish religion at this time was accepted by the Roman authorities, but not Christianity. And so that's the, the cultural context that they, they were in. What about accepting it into the, the canons, accepting it into the Bible? Um, it was easily accepted in the East, but it took longer for its adoption in the West. 
and this is due to the debates over authorship. Many churches' fathers used Hebrews anyway, so they still thought that there was a lot of utility and, and value in it. It was never doubted in the East, and Jerome and Augustine convinced the Western church that they should be incorporated. So what were some of the contributions that we have um, in terms of theology, doctrine, and what have you? There's a heavily emphasis on Christology. So we get a lot of insight into who Christ is, um, and particularly Jesus' priestly work. Um, and we, we talked about this priest according to um, Melchizedek. There's extensive use of the Old Testament, so a Jewish Christian would really find it a value. And for us, it's helpful for us for theological understanding. And there's an independent slant on movement from Israel to the church. And so gradually, that's what we're seeing, that um, um, the church was grafted into um, what, what the, the Lord initially had done. And this is that faithful remnant that um, is now part of that faithful remnant that were, were included. Emphasis on perseverance and the, the danger of apostasy. So once again, a very high overview, and that's the summary that we'll go over for Hebrews. And next week, we'll get a chance to go into a little bit more detail with as we review the material in the study guide. Next, we'll go through the, the book of James, and um, this will go fairly quickly as well with this um, overview. And so um, I recently have been um, come to be familiar with one of the ways you can consider James as like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And um, it was definitely an epistle um, that I, I think it is um, safe to, to say that it was um, James the Just that was one of the ways that the early church fathers called him, the half-brother of Jesus who became the, the bishop of the church of Jerusalem. And so he was writing to Jewish Christian houses outside of Palestine. So Palestine is this um, district in which um, Jerusalem is, is in. And so this is where the nation of Israel is currently. So he's talking to about all the the, the 12 tribes that have um, gone out in the dispersion to other places around the, the Roman Empire. And so it was set through most of the ancient Mediterranean world. And so um, I think it's easily um, <clears throat> the, the case that this is probably one of the earliest um, New Testament letters that was written, if not the earliest New Testament letters written. So it's not very long. Um, it has a, a greeting, and then it talks about the, the testing of faith, of trials, um, wisdom that we, we get from God to help us get through those trials. Um, and so that's an important thing. And then this, how we can have this ability to endure trials and, and, and avoid this process of temptation. So being a aware of the process of temptation so we can avoid it. That's an important. And then James does a great job of talking about being um, not just hearing the word, but doing the word. And so we get a chance um, by the grace of God to be actively involved in the actions that the Lord would want us to be doing in, in kingdom work. And so we, we get a chance to be hearing that um, and, and understand how we should be doing that in, in this next part of um, James. Then he talks about the, the sin of partiality, um, talking about how we should be treating wealthy versus the poor in assembly, and that he uses some interesting um, phraseology that the, the well shall um, become aware of their poor, of their poverty, and the poor shall become aware of their riches. And um, that is something that we should be treating all believers equally. Um, and then this faith without works is dead. It's not that we're saved by works, but we, we demonstrate our faith. We live in our faith by what we do. And so he gives examples of how that is laid out. Um, we need to be taming the tongue, which 
is an incredibly important thing. And he uses an analogy of a rudder. And so that is an important thing for, for us. Um, we need to be careful. Um, the sins of, of the wealthy, of how we treat wealth, if it goes to our head. And, and so we, he's trying to, to have us be clear in our understanding how to avoid that. Um, the, the prayer of faith, uh, the prayer um, of a faithful individual um, can promote healing. And, um, and so we should be praying for one another um, and for, for the forgiveness of sins. And finally, he concludes with um, an admonition. A lot of really great material and the outline tries to give a structure for that, but by its very nature, it means that we're not covering a lot of things. So in terms of the author, there are various people that we have in scripture by the name of James, but I think that the most compelling argument is it's James, the half brother of Jesus, called James the Just, who became the, the Bishop of Jerusalem. And so that's the reason why I highlighted that in red. There's other possibilities and um, uh, in the various modern synthesis arguments that people might want to, to mention. In the textbook, it gets into that. I'm not going to really dwell on that. But in terms of observation of the text, that the, the Greek in James is polished. Um, there, that is uh, something that you can note about it. Um, it does have um, religious and philosophical concepts. And so it seemed to be what you might find in some wisdom literature. And so that's one of the reasons why I highlighted that. Um, we can see how the Old Testament and Judaism is, is treated. And so um, we, we get that in that perspective of trying to be thinking from a Jewish tradition and how to think in terms of now a, a Christian uh, um, per perspective, a, a Jewish Christian. Um, so some more things talking about the possible relationship between the way James is presenting things versus the way Paul is. Really, they're the complementary, but um, we, we get some perspectives on, on that. So in terms of where it was written, the proven, provenance, um, maybe it was um, written from Rome, that some might argue, but I think it's a lot more likely that it was written from Jerusalem since that was a, a big location where James was at and he did his, his ministry there um, being the, the Bishop of Jerusalem. So um, and then we start to consider the options for when it was written and looking at what we have in the text and other context. Um, so was it before or after the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15? Um, I think um, the best case is this is the, the one of the earliest, if not the earliest um, letter, and that it came before the Jerusalem Council, and it was written in the mid 40s. So we're talking less than, you know, on the order of like five to 10 years after Jesus' resurrection. So it gives us an idea that these letters were written not too long after Christ's resurrection. And so who is it addressed to? It's to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And so there's this, um, this dispersion of, of Jews. He's trying to, to minister to them and give them some useful insight in these, these um, individuals that are scattered around. And so there's various thoughts about, well, what type of genre does it have, and it seems like it has a variety of different things, um, giving some pastoral admonition, that's, that's for sure. Um, trying to think about um, Jewish works and, and the traditions that, that Jesus was introducing. But I also like to, to be highlighting that there's this wisdom literature type of component and um, trying to help us understand how to deal with the tongue, how to deal with temptation, um, and, and things like that. Um, in terms of the adoption into the canon, um, it, it definitely, this, this book was something that influenced um, the early church fathers like the Shepherd of Hermas and um, Clement as he was writing First Clement. Um, Clement of Alexandria, another Clement, wrote a commentary on James. Origen cited it as scripture 
and Eusebius, while the first church historian classified it as a quote, disputed book. So um, anyway, those are just some, some various points of view that have been put out there and um, giving some, some possible thoughts on that. Um, Jerome fully accepted James and liter um, Luther accepted it as canonicity. So I'm just gonna focus on, on a few here. Um, um, so it was accepted as a um, definitely a perfectly fine book. Maybe some might put it into a secondary status, but not trying to argue that it's not inspired. But I think Luther spent a lot of time focusing on what was written in Paul and um, trying to understand what it means to be justified by faith and um, sola scriptura, um, focusing only on scripture. In terms of the contributions of James, um, it's definitely a genuine Christian faith must be evident in action. So this action is not what saves us, but it demonstrates that we're, we're vibrant in our faith. Um, double blindness is, is the basic um, sin that needs to be rooted out. There gives a nice justification that is nuanced differently than Paul. And so um, James tries to be important, talking about the importance of acting on our faith, but that doesn't mean that we're saved by those actions, but it's just, it's us living out what we're made to do. And he speaks loudly against um, being quiet amongst the Christians. And so that would once again, reflect that idea of being involved in the work of our faith. So a lot of really good material that we have um, in the in this this wonderful um, these wonderful books that we've covered, but I'm going to go ahead and finish with that, and um, I'll go ahead and close this in prayer, and um, just thankful again that we get a chance to study this rich material. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight that we could study your Word. Pray that you would um, have this help us to better understand the wonderful ways in Scripture how you work with specific individuals and, and be knowledgeable that we can be actively involved just like they are. Pray you give us a, a good week and keep us connected to you in all our ways. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. With that, um, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. And um, say thank you very much. God bless everybody.